Before I call the Deputy Prime Minister to make his statement, I have to say to him and to the Government I am extremely disappointed that once again an important Government policy has been presented to the media before this House. Why the BBC and Sky News is more important, I will never know. That is simply, and I will say again, that is simply not acceptable. One thing which did not change in the recently revised Ministerial Code was the important statement. When Parliament is in session, the most important announcements of Government policy should be made in the first instance in Parliament. But yet again, the media have been the first to know. I am glad that the Minister is making the statement, but he should have done that before speaking to the media. I would certainly have granted an urgent question, and I have got to say thank Mr Bone for putting one in just in case, had the statement not been forthcoming. And the Government should be aware that I will always do this in similar circumstances. And I have got to say, I nearly granted both. And I don't want to put in that position again. So please respect this house, respect members of every political party. They're elected to hear it here, not via the news. Deputy Prime Minister. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, thank you. And uh, I, of course, heed his advice as ever. We uh, strived uh, to make sure that we uh, only kept within the, the trammels of what had gone out in the consultation document. But I heed his advice as ever. And with your permission, I will make a statement on the publication and introduction of a UK Bill of Rights as we take the next steps to fulfil our manifesto commitment and deliver human rights reform across the country. Mr Speaker, we have a proud tradition of freedom under the rule of law in this country, and I would remind honourable members on all sides that it dates back centuries to Magna Carta, not just 1998. The Bill of Rights is the next chapter in the evolution and the strengthening of our human rights framework. It is published today and available online and, I believe, in the vote office. Mr Speaker, let me turn to the key strands of our reforms. First, and again to remind the House, as I said when we launched the consultation back in December, the UK intends to remain a state party to the European Convention on Human Rights. It is a common sense set of principles, and the problems that we have uh, encountered have stemmed from the elastic interpretations and the expansion, absent meaningful democratic oversight, in particular as a result of the procedural framework set out in the Human Rights Act. And so, Mr Speaker, our key objectives with, re with reform are to reinforce those quintessentially UK-wide rights, like freedom of speech, the liberty that guards all of the others, and we will also recognise the role of jury trial mindful of how it operates in different parts of the United Kingdom and something which is not prevalent on the continent but is very much part of the heritage and the pedigree of this country. These liberties are part of our proud history but they are also critical to strengthening our place in the world as an open, vibrant and rambunctious democracy. Mr Speaker, next we will strengthen the separation of powers in this country, affirming the supremacy of the Supreme Court being explicit that the UK courts are under no obligation to follow the Strasbourg case law and indeed are free to diverge from it. I am proud of our world-beating judiciary. And what else, is the point, what else is the point of a Supreme Court if it bows in subordination to a European one? Mr Speaker, we have also seen the goalposts on human rights shift over time through expansive judicial interpretations licensed by the Human Rights Act, which has tended to magnify overweening rulings from Strasbourg, although it is worth noting in fairness that there has been more judicial restraint in Strasbourg uh, on, on occasion in recent times. Nevertheless, Mr Speaker, what ebbs may flow, and we will ensure in our Bill of Rights that any expansion of human rights law, as opposed to its interpretation, is subject to proper democratic oversight by elected members in this House. Yeah. Our reforms in particular to sections 2 and 3 of the Human Rights Act will squarely address those flaws in the current framework. And we will also be crystal clear that when it comes to the laws of the land and the legitimate necessity, uh, necessary and constructive dialogue that we have with Stra Strasbourg, it is Parliament that has the last word. There has been much said by the judiciary in Strasbourg about an age of subsidiarity with greater respect for the will of domestic 
democratic institutions, particularly since the 2012 Brighton Declaration that the UK is very much spearheading to uh, promote reform. Our approach is crafted very much with that in mind, to facilitate that dialogue between the United Kingdom and Strasbourg and avail ourselves of the margin of appreciation which is uh, within the bounds of the Convention. Equally, as a matter of basic democratic principle, we'll, we will reaffirm and reinforce the democratic oversight and control exercised by this House. Now, Mr Speaker, our Bill of Rights sets out a range of important reforms, a permission stage in the UK courts to assert greater checks over frivolous claims at an earlier stage. That, of course, reflects the Strasbourg Court itself, which has an admissibility stage. We have included provision to ensure that behaviour of anyone claiming a breach of their human rights is taken into account when our courts consider compensation. It is a principle of, uh, of law in this country that those who come to equity do so with clean hands. I think that should be reflected in human rights claims as well. We will also expressly Mr. Speaker, provide for greater weight to be given to Parliament's determination of the public interests set out in primary legislation when considering the interpretation of rights to ensure we are better equipped to protect the public. And that will reinforce our ability to, for example, deport more foreign national offenders, and in particular, those claiming ever more elastic interpretations of Article 8 and the right to family life to frustrate the deportation process. It will also ensure we can deliver our reforms to the parole system. So when it comes to those finely balanced assessments of risk, in decisions on the release of potentially dangerous offenders, public protection is the overriding priority. Our Bill of Rights will also mean that we can prevent well-meaning but counterproductive and onerous straitjacket regulatory burdens being placed on our public services, resulting from rulings determined by lawyers in court rather on such sensitive matters being set by elected lawmakers in this House. That is particularly important, Mr Speaker, with respect to finely balanced assessments of social policy matters with financial impact, the bread and butter issues that it is for this Parliament to decide. Mr Speaker, we have consulted and engaged very widely across the whole of the United Kingdom. We will continue to do so. This is a UK-wide reform, but we want to work with all of the devolved administrations on these essential reforms, so we will be seeking legislative consent motions, noting nevertheless that the status of the Human Rights Act is as a and I quote, protected enactment under the devolved settlements. So uh, reform, replacement, revision can only take place from Westminster. Mr Speaker, our Bill of Rights will strengthen our proud tradition of freedom. It will demarcate a clearer separation of powers. It will ensure greater respect for our democratic institutions, and it will better protect the public and restore a healthy dose of common sense to the justice system, which is essential for commanding public confidence. Ultimately, it will make us freer, it will help keep our streets safer, and I commend this statement to the House. I now call the Shadow Minister, Ellie Reeves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I'm sure the whole House will want to join me in sending our deepest condolences to my honourable friend, the member for Croydon North, who, following the death of his father last week, cannot be here today. Mr Speaker, this is a very dark day for victims of crime, for women, for people in care, for everyone in this country who rely on the state to protect them from harm. This is not a Bill of Rights, it's a con. The Lord Chancellor knows this because he's been working on it for over a decade. We know from the Queen's speech that this Bill will take away the duty of the state to protect everyone from harm by removing the positive obligations set out in the Human Rights Act. It will force victims of crime seeking justice to schlep to Strasbourg, creating endless delays and red tape. Sir Peter Gross and the review panel does not think the Human Rights Act undermines parliamentary sovereignty or that the UK courts are undermined by the European Court. So why proceed with this bill in the first place? It's because this is a government that looks to pick a fight to cover up its own failures and then yeah. finds someone else to blame. Yeah. 
We have seen a succession of Conservative members do this in the form of blaming the European Court to deflect from their bungled and unworkable asylum policy. Some, shamefully, have even demanded that the UK withdraws altogether from the European Convention of Human Rights. For members of the party of Churchill, who inspired the European Convention of Human Rights to want to do away with it altogether, is really quite something. I gather that he doesn't want to withdraw from the European Convention, not least because he knows it would fatally undermine the Good Friday Agreement and peace in Northern Ireland. So will he now condemn members of his own party who have made this dangerous and reckless demand? Mr Speaker, we on this side of the House are proud of the gift that Churchill gave to the world in the Universal Declaration and in the European Convention that followed. But we are prouder still that it was a Labour government in 1998 that brought rights home from Strasbourg. The Human Rights Act is held up around the world as an exemplar of modern human rights legislation, which is why the European Court very rarely overrules our judges, something that the review panel recognised in their report. It is a beacon of hope to people in countries whose basic human rights are trampled over by strong men and dictators. And there is no better example right now than in Ukraine, where the rights of millions are being crushed under the jackboot of Vladimir Putin. What stunning hypocrisy from this government to preach to others about the importance of defending rights abroad while snatching British people's rights away at home. This is a government gimmick by a party which seeks headlines for botched policies and then blames others when it fails. The answer to fixing the mess this Conservative government has made of the immigration and asylum system isn't to take away British people's rights given to them by the Human Rights Act. The Human Rights Act has allowed people to object when doctors put do not resuscitate orders on their beds without their consent. It's allowed people with learning disabilities imprisoned in locked units to be reunited with their families. It's allowed families of major disasters like Manchester or Hillsborough to seek justice where public bodies have let them down. It's allowed elderly married couples in residential care to object when care home managers try to separate them. And it's allowed victims of rapists like John Warboys from forcing the police to investigate cases of rape. Mr Speaker, this Bill of Rights con isn't just an attack on victims of crime who the state has failed to protect. It's an attack on women. Women have used the Human Rights Act to challenge the police when they have either failed or refused to investigate rape and sexual assault cases. We saw it in the case of John Warboys, who is thought to have assaulted over 150 women. It should come as no surprise that this bill has been put forward by a Conservative government that has effectively decriminalised rape. Last week's week's scorecards scorecards show pitiful progress on the record low... Some people will be wanting to catch my eye. They won't catch it by shouting somebody who's speaking. A lyrics. Last week's scorecards showed pitiful progress on the record low rape convictions under this government. The typical wait for cases to complete in court has reached three years and a fifth have seen waits of four years. And that's if the case even gets to court. The number of rape trials postponed in our Crown Court at a day's notice has risen fourfold. It's no wonder that rape survivors are dropping out of their cases in droves. So will victims even bother to report their case at all when they learn his Bill of Rights will stop them from forcing our under-resourced police to investigate? It says everything about a Lord Chancellor and a government that is soft on rape, soft on rapists and hard on survivors that they want to take away the final backstop available to victims to get justice. Women will be in no doubt this is a government that lets off rapists and lets survivors down and today is the proof. Mr Speaker, this bill will see enormous amounts of red tape for victims of crime seeking justice. It's an attack on women. It undermines peace in Northern Ireland. It's the hallmark of a party out of ideas that can no longer govern. Yeah. To front benches, there are times given. Can we please stick to them? I don't want to stop ministers or shadow ministers, but I will in the future. You've got to stick to the time allocated. Right. 
no, let's back to, back to the Secretary of State. I'm now going to go back to the Deputy Prime Minister. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I join with what the Honourable Lady said about uh, uh, the Honourable Gentleman from Croydon North? Can I extend my sympathy and my condolences to him? <laughs> I listened very carefully to what the Shadow Justice Secretary said. Um, I think I disagree with everything she said, but then again, she said very little about our Bill of Rights. Um, and when she gets a chance to read it, I look forward to debating uh, uh, it with her further. Um, but can I just correct a couple of the obviously flawed things she said? She talked about uh, whether or not we were going to leave the European Convention. When she does get a chance to read the Bill of Rights, you'll see not only we're staying apart the state, uh, of the ECHR, but it is incorporated in the Bill of Rights. I, I have to say, the comparison with what Russia or Putin does. I'm afraid shows a lack of moral compass on the side of those benches, not these. And then she diverted into uh, a monologue on a very serious subject, uh, which is in relation to rape. Let us be absolutely crystal clear. There is absolutely nothing in this Bill of Rights that will do anything to weaken the protections of victims. Far from it in relation to deportation of foreign national exactly. criminals, in relation to the release of dangerous rapists, in relation to what we do inside our prisons, this will strengthen our protection of victims and public protection. Uh, again, for the record, on such a serious issue, on which I agree with her of the importance, she might get her facts straight. The volume of rape convictions has increased by two-thirds in the last year alone, and working very closely with the Home Secretary, the Attorney General, the Director of Public Prosecutions, we're absolutely determined and arrest us to go even further and faster. But I suspect, Mr Speaker, that this was really a distraction from what the fundamental issue is, which is the Bill of Rights and human rights reform to get the right balance. Can I just say to her, um, she is, uh, and I think the Labour Party, are blind to the flaws in the Human Rights Act in a way that its architects are not. Uh, Jack Straw said back in 2007 yeah. that he wanted to rebalance the rights set out in the Act, adding explicitly responsibilities should play a role. They're all in here in our Bill of Rights. He went on to say in an interview in December 2008 that there is a sense that it has become a villain's charter. Now, Mr Speaker, I haven't used that language, but I would just say how far uh, the sense of critical self-evaluation on the Labour benches has come when she cannot talk about anything that co could possibly be uh, reformed. Um, the model that we've taken is based on a textbook that I read back in 1999, uh, written by a very learned authority, and he said, in relation to the relationship between the UK and Strasbourg, and she mentioned that not with any um, specific points, but uh, the, the author said that the relationship between uh, the, the, the role of the Strasbourg Court is primarily concerned with supervision, and its role is therefore subsidiary to that of domestic authorities, subsidiary, not, not superior. It has no role unless the domestic system for protecting human rights breaks down altogether. The Honourable Gentleman from Sedentary Position asked who was the author. The author was the leader of the Labour Party. <laughs> In his seminal textbook on the subject. And all I would just gently say is I think he made a more convincing lawyer than he does a politician. <laughs> Mr Speaker, this week we've seen Labour shadow ministers line up with picketers against the public. Today, the Shadow Justice Minister has confirmed the Labour Party will stand in the way of our common sense reforms that will ensure a better balance of human rights so that we can stand up for victims. They're always against that when it comes to the uh, uh, sentencing or uh, extra police recruitment. So that we can stand up for victims, deport more foreign national offenders, and safely incarcerate the most dangerous people in our prisons. Whenever they're asked the big questions, they duck. Yet again, the Labour Party has shown they're simply not fit to govern. Yeah. Peter Bowles. Uh, Speaker, can I thank you for your statement before the, the beginning of this statement? I think the vast majority of members in this House would agree entirely with you. Could I ask the Secretary of State, and congratulating uh, on, on his statement, there's really a very simple issue here. The so this sovereign parliament makes laws, and our in courts interpret them. What we shouldn't have is a European court not interpreting them, but actually making new laws, yeah. judicial creep. So whilst I'm willing to support this bill, would he be willing 
to agree with me, if in practice this bill fails, he'll support my private member's bill, taking us out of the European Court of Human Rights. Well, can I thank the honourable gentleman for his tenacity uh, in all of these matters? And I always listen and will study his private member's bill with great care. He made two points. One is that there's no point really in having a Supreme Court if it's subordinated to Strasbourg. When it comes to the interpretation of the law, he must be right. Our Bill of Rights will expressly address that. The other point he made, which is a more subtle one, but I think very powerful, and I remember many debates where we jointly participated together on prisoner voting rights. It's very clear that was an example of the goalposts shifting. When it comes to legislative functions, of which that was an example, it must be right. It ought to be a point of uh, common agreement across all the benches that on those matters it must be for honourable members, accountable our constituents, to decide it in this House. SNP spokesperson, Anne McLaughlin. Mr Speaker, this... Uh Bill of Rights and the removal of the Human Rights Act is a culmination of multiple pieces of legislation that have gone through this place in the last year. And they're all about one thing. It's about removing human rights from human beings. Yeah. First they came for the refugees with the Nationality and Borders Act and they told them that their lives didn't count. Second, they came for those who need to question decisions made about their lives by public bodies, including this government, in the Judicial Review Act, where they stopped them being effectively, effectively able to do that. Yeah, yeah. Then they went for the voters in the elections bill. Yeah, and, yeah. and what do you know? It was the voters they were targeting were the ones least likely to vote Conservative, the it's sensible ones and otherwise. <laughs> in other words, then they went for the gypsy Roma traveller communities yeah. with the policing yeah. bill and told them that their way of life was unacceptable yeah. to us. Well, it's not unacceptable yeah, to yeah. us. Yeah, yeah. And then when they didn't get their way out over public order in the policing bill, they repackaged it and brought it together in the public order bill. And that is taking away the rights of anybody to fight for the rights of anybody else. And who would go to, who would go to a protest when they can be stopped and searched without any suspicion? Yeah. It's all about one thing. It's about removing human rights from human beings. And here today, this is the culmination of all of it. It's about removing everybody's human rights. Because human rights are not about one group of people, the group of people that he likes to pick on. Human rights are about everybody living on these islands. So I've got three quick questions, and I'll leave the rest to my colleagues. One, why the lack of pre-legislative scrutiny? What are they so afraid of? Two, why, why is he telling people that this will bring rights home when in actual fact it will force people to go to Strasbourg in order to get justice? And finally, the Scottish and Welsh governments have made it clear that they are completely against this in its entirety. So how does he... We have a tale of two countries, Scotland embedding human rights law into all of its legislation, yep. this government stripping it away completely. How would he advise the people of Scotland who want to retain human rights law in their, in their legislation, how would he advise them to vote in next year's independence referendum? Yeah. Yes yeah, or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can I uh, thank the Honourable Lady? Look, I, I clearly disagree with what she's just said. I mean, first, firstly... No country has been more big-hearted when it comes to those fleeing persecution, from the Hong Kong BNOs to the 17,000 uh, that were um, evacuated uh, out of Afghanistan, through to the 125,000-plus visas in relation to Ukraine. She, she, she talks about standing up for those people. In Ukraine, in the Parliament, when the Prime Minister, when our Prime Minister addressed them, they had Union Jacks fly. They were singing uh, God Save the Queen in towns and villages across the country. And I think, when it comes to protecting human rights, uh, we should be big-hearted, but we should also stop the trade... The trade in human misery, which is a real threat to human rights that we see across the Channel, and also make sure we stand up for victims, she doesn't seem to care too much about that, in relation to the deportation of foreign national offenders. And I think that is something that the people of Scotland, the people of Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, will all agree on. And why wouldn't she support common sense reforms, a rebalancing of the system that will allow us to stand up for the victims, stand up for the public, and remove those serious foreign criminals? Yes. Sir Robert Butler. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Speaker. Um, I welcome this statement today. It builds upon the work that I and Sir Peter Gross did with his important review. And Sir Peter's Balance Committee did not say that all was well with the Human Rights Act. There were issues to be dealt with. And in accordance with our manifesto commitment to update the Act, this bill is timely. Does he agree with me 
that uh, over and above domestic action that we can take to reform and improve legislation, there is a strong case for international work to be done on the same basis that we did in Brighton ten years ago to deal with issues such as extraterritorial jurisdiction, which is a common concern not just of this country but of our judges and many other member states of the Council of Europe. I thank my right hon. Friend and pay tribute to the groundwork that he did in the Ministry of Justice, painstakingly, uh, and also to the work of Sir Peter Gross and his panel, all of which substantially influenced the shape of the reforms that we're able to announce today, and they wouldn't have been possible without the hard work that my right honourable friend put in. Um, the, uh, he's right also to point to the 2012 Brighton Declaration, because the Strasbourg Court, and under Robert Spano, the latest Icelandic president, has talked about shifting from an age of a living instrument to an age of subsidiarity. And when people talk about uh, our relationship, I think it's important that we stick to the Convention, but also that the European Court follows its own uh, uh, strictures. Um, he's also mentioned extraterritorial jurisdiction. I will certainly follow up on his advice. That is also something which is addressed in the Bill of Rights. And again, I thank him for his contribution to today. Right. Where should we go? Kate Green. Much, Mr. Speaker. The Deputy Prime Minister is right about the priority that must be given to public protection, but can I urge him to proceed with care in reforming parole arrangements? Ministers have already taken measures which will give them a veto over the transfer of prisoners serving indeterminate sentences to open conditions, and he will know that there are real concerns that such measures, as well as being procedurally unfair, may actually increase the risk to protection of the public. Can I ask him to reassure the House that he will make public protection a priority over political gimmickry? Well, can I thank the Honourable Lady for what she said? <coughs> I certainly agree with her that public protection is our overriding concern. In relation to parole reform, the proposals that we publish for consultation make clear that in the context of uh, convicted murderers, rapists, terrorists uh, and child killers, uh, that we want to be able to make sure that there is a ministerial check in these finely balanced cases where risk is hard to predict, but where there is genuine risk to the public and to public confidence. I hope she will agree with me, if we are agreed on the principle of putting public protection first, that that is something that should command cross-party support. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am frankly disgusted by what the Shadow Minister had to say, and in particular to suggest that honourable members on this side would be soft on rapists. She sits there shaking her head now. That is a shameful thing to say, and it undermines the confidence of women across this country in our judicial system. So does my right honourable friend agree with me that we can be incredibly confident in the years, centuries of our UK judicial system to represent the interests of everybody in this country and does he also share my sadness at so many on the opposition benches who would throw our sovereignty away to anyone else who would have it yeah. 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 mr speaker I, I agree entirely with my right honourable friend she's right that there never seems to be an opportunity to throw away the powers and the authority that we have in this house which they don't grasp with total alacrity yeah. and just in relation to uh, the issue of rape it is such a sensitive issue, and we have seen that increase in convictions by two thirds. I would, and there's a whole range of other work, Operation Satiria, pre recorded witness evidence under Section 28, disclosure reforms that uh, my honourable friend is, is looking at, that we ought to be trying to uh, build on the, 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 the progress that we've made and, uh, and, and not do it down, because that's the stuff that undermines women's confidence in the justice system. We know there's a longer road. Hold on. The, the, Mr. Speaker, we know that there is much more to do, but that work's not going to get done with, frankly, uh, hyperbolic language that the Honourable Lady used. Vice Chair of the Select Committee, Joanna Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, as Acting Chair of the Joint Committee on Human Rights, I'd like to remind the Secretary of State that we've completed two in depth, unanimous cross party reports which concluded that the Human Rights Act is working well and doesn't need to be repealed or replaced. Ah. And indeed, that was the conclusion of the independent review, which she commissioned and then ignored. Now, when we visited Strasbourg last week, we were, told, we were told that UK government ministers have given repeated assurances that the UK will remain in the ECHR, and I was pleased to hear him reiterate that assurance this morning. 
However, the Prime Minister did make some veiled threats in the opposite direction last week. But if we're going to stay in the ECHR, it needs to be done with integrity, and we can't pick and choose which convention rights we want to observe, nor, from, nor for whom we want to observe them. So does the Secretary of State appreciate that the United Kingdom's disengagement from the ECHR, and make no mistake, Mr Speaker, that's what this bill is about, mm -hmm. does he appreciate that the UK's disengagement from the ECHR risks giving encouragement to populist governments in Eastern Europe indeed. who have scant regard for human rights or indeed the rule of law? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, no, I, I'm afraid I don't agree with the Honourable Lady, uh, not least because I don't see how she can sustain the argument that we're dislocating ourselves when not only are we remaining a state party, it's in the Bill of Rights as well. Um, can I just say, in relation to her committee, that I pay tribute to the work it does. I appeared in front of the uh, JCHR on the 8th of December. Um, uh, uh, the uh, noble Lord, Lord uh, Wolf Wolfson, appeared uh, on the 2nd of February. Uh, I'm attending again on the 20th of July, so we will pay great respect to the role that the Joint Committee has. Um, but, of course, uh, we know that there are likely to be objections, uh, and uh, uh, we will try and assuage uh, her and her members as best we can. So, William Cash. Mr Speaker, uh, will my right honourable friend accept that there will be many who will be extremely glad that he has now introduced his Bill of Rights, and, as he said just now, that our Parliament and our judges will have the last word but we look forward to seeing the text of the bill and we trust that it will ensure that the European Court in Strasbourg will never again be able to frustrate the United Kingdom's right to deport illegal immigrants and at the same time override our own judges. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just say to my um, honourable friend, pay tribute to the long-standing work he's done, the constitutional dimension in particular, and to give them the direct assurance, I have the copy of the Bill of Rights, it's available in the House, uh, uh, that, that we address squarely the issue that he raises, uh, and we want to make sure the elected members on all sides have the last word when it comes to resetting and expanding the laws of this land. And this lot, uh, Mr Speaker, this morning the distinguished legal commentator Joshua Rosenberg summed up this bill not as the biggest constitutional tour de force in over 300 years or the apex of the Justice Secretary's career, but as a rag bag of restrictions. It will undoubtedly cause harm to many thousands of our citizens, especially those who are most vulnerable and suffer discrimination by an unchecked state, and it will cause harm to this country's hard-won reputation as a champion of international law. But as a constitutional document, isn't it a damp squib and a legal nonsense that sets up confusion and conflict between domestic and European courts. <coughs> can, can I just gently say to the Honourable Gentleman, who I'm quite fond of, and we've debated these issues many times, it can't be ripping up human rights and a damp squib. It can't be both. Can I suggest, can I suggest he reads what everyone from Jonathan Fisher QC, who's written, uh, I think, a very thoughtful piece about reform, uh, what Lord Sumption, former uh, Justice of the Supreme Court, has written recently on this. Uh, and also John Larkin, a former Attorney General in Northern Ireland, and he might get a slightly more sober analysis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank my right honourable friend for the letter he wrote to the Select Committee, the Justice Select Committee, this morning. In it he said, the bill will prevent human rights from being used as a way to bring claims on overseas military operations. But he will recall that some of the gravest crimes of the Iraq war were only revealed through recourse to the Human Rights Act enforced in our domestic courts. I think particularly of the systematic torture of detainees by British soldiers in Basra that was revealed in the Baha Musa case, uh, only because of the Human Rights Act after the Ministry of Defence had declined to investigate. So can he provide reassurances to the House that the new Bill of Rights will not operate to suppress such serious human rights abuses from coming to light in the future. Can I, can I say to the Honourable Lady, I understand the point she makes, and of course we need to have proper accountability whenever anything goes wrong, and our professionalism of our armed forces is second to none, but mistakes can happen and there needs to be accountability. But the reality is we have the international law of armed conflict, which is designed to that, 
and it has been unhelpful, indeed it has created legal uncertainty, to layer on top of that an extra tier of human rights obligations. It's created uncertainties to the state of the law and created huge uncertainty for our armed forces. So we'll make sure that there is the accountability she, uh, she, um, she, she, she looks for, but we will also deal with the extraterritorial jurisdiction, which frankly has encouraged litigation and many spurious claims, as well as the ones that she mentions. Oh, Mr. Carl Thank you. Mr. Speaker. Paragraph 2 of the Human Rights Chapter of the Good Friday Agreement pro provides that the British Government will complete incorporation into Northern Ireland law of the European Convention on Human Rights with direct access to the courts and remedies for breach of the Convention. So can the Justice Secretary tell the House whether his bill constitutes a unilateral repudiation of that, or is this something that he's negotiated with the Government of Ireland? Uh -huh. Can I thank the Honourable, uh, the right honourable gentleman? He's wrong. Uh, we remain a state party to the Convention. Uh, he's right to reference. He's right to reference the Belfast Agreement, and not only we're a state party, but the uh, ECHR remains incorporated into UK law through the schedule. And if he looks at the bill, I will. He's chuntering from a sedentary position. Genuinely, I enjoy debating these issues. We have on many occasions. Read the bill, and I'm very happy to address any other questions he's got. Sir John Hayes. I am very grateful, Mr Speaker. The uh, Secretary of State and the Attorney General are to be commended for taking this task seriously. That task is to take back control of our ancient legal entitlements from unelected, unaccountable foreign judges and root them in the People's Parliament here in Westminster. But in doing so, will he challenge the very assumptions which underpin the Human Rights Act? That is that rights are more important than responsibilities. That is that individual interest is more important than duty. That is the fundamental issue here. Will he challenge and dock at last the long tail of Blairism? You know, I thank uh, my honourable friend for the colourful and eloquent way as ever he presents this. Uh, I do think that when it comes to collective interest, social policy, finely balanced uh, judgments around public protection, that adjudication in court by lawyers uh, rather than uh, a broader discussion and debate around, among elected uh, uh, members of parliament accountable to their citizens, I think is, is a mistake. Um, we will protect the fundamental freedoms that make this country great. They existed long before the Human Rights Act and they will list, uh, exist long after. But he's right about this balance between protecting individual liberty and the freedom under uh, the rule of law, of which I'm immensely proud, and making sure elected members in this House can protect the public, take finely balanced judgments on social policy, and also ones which affect the public purse. Thank you, Mr Speaker. For many of our constituents who have seen the benefits of human rights, whether those who were bereaved widows who had to take the government to court to make sure that their children were not ignored when it came to pensions because they were unmarried, or indeed the women in Northern Ireland who today are counting on us to support the statutory instrument to make sure that they get their human rights to choose what happens to their own body and have abortion, they will be reassured by the uh, Deputy Prime Minister saying that we will remain signatories to the European Convention. So can he just confirm for his colleagues who might want to think about what the implications of that are, that because we will remain signatories to the European Convention, the ECHR will remain the ultimate judicial decision maker on human rights in this country because we will still be bound by the Convention. He's not getting rid of Europe, he's just wasting our time. Yeah. The Honourable Lady was right about the first point, wrong about the second. It's clear from the Bill of Rights. David Dibbs. My right honourable friend uh, started off by talking about the 2012 uh, Declaration on Subsidiarity. He will remember, of course, that that flowed directly from action in this chamber, uh, uh, pushing back against uh, prisoner votes, which I think he was a major part of. Uh, so, but with respect to this Bill of Rights, we haven't seen the detail yet, but there are two Conservative tests to it. One is that Conservatives do not believe in an overmighty state, and therefore the state has to be curbed by an independent body. And secondly, that our fundamental freedoms, whether are from free speech uh, or jury trial, or as the Honourable Lady for Newbury mentioned, uh, freedom from torture, our fundamental freedoms are not the gift of the state. They are the birthright of our citizens. And as such, these all have to be protected by, the, uh, by powers vested in an independent judiciary. So the test at the end of the day of the Bill of Rights will be whether or not it delivers a better protection for those things than the European process does at one. 
Can I thank my right honourable friend? And I think he's uh, been too generous. He was really the architect of um, uh, the campaign uh, to defend this House prerogatives to decide on prisoner voting. Uh, interestingly, Mr Speaker, he did that with Jack Straw, the architect of the Human Rights Act, uh, but he's right also that it was this House that pushed back and, and sought the Government in 2012 to uh, make sure that the Strasbourg Court was reflecting and following its mandate, which was at the heart of what the Brighton Declaration process was all about. He's absolutely right in his test, and I hope I can reassure him, and when he gets a chance, as I know he, he will, to study very carefully the Bill of Rights, which is now uh, available, he will see that our fundamental freedoms are not being trashed, they're being preserved and safeguarded. He will see that judicial independence is strengthened because this Supreme Court in this country uh, ought to have the last word and indeed to cherish and nurture the common law tradition that we have in this country, which is ancient. And finally, at one point he missed, I, uh, missed out, but, but, but I hope he agrees with me on, is that in broader uh, terms, beyond individual rights, there's a whole realm of public policy, whether it affects collective interests, social policy, uh, the public purse, public protection, where it must be this House, elected members, responsible to our constituents who have the final word. Very sure. Mr. Uh, can I ask the Secretary of State um, to uh, share with me uh, the level of support that he's got for this uh, legislation uh, from the people that will make it work, the lawyers, the judges, the professionals? I, Mr Speaker, I'm not a lawyer, but because I campaigned with the uh, right honourable gentleman, the member for Bromley uh, uh, and old Sidcup on miscarriages of justice, I mix with a lot of lawyers. And I have to say to the Secretary of State, I'm worried about how many lawyers do not understand the reason for this at this moment. Mr Speaker, there have been three Queen's speeches with a promise for a royal commission into the justice system. That has never appeared, has not gone anywhere. And Mr Speaker, the last thing I want the Secretary of State to remember, the justice system anyway is in such a mess. The barristers are on strike, we can't get criminal lawyers to, to represent anyone, and the fact of the matter is the Department of Justice has got the biggest cuts in budget since 2010 from any other department. The Honourable Gentleman, and again, I always enjoy engaging with him, is just simply wrong. We've got the biggest increase uh, from this, in the spending review for over a decade. Simply wrong on the facts. Happy to write to him. On lawyers, look, of course, different lawyers will take different views, but I, I don't think there are any greater authority than Lord Sumption, former uh, Justice of the Supreme Court, Jonathan Fisher QC. But he's shaking his head. He's, he's just asked me to point him in the direction of some lawyers, that, that, and I'm giving him the most authoritative that, I, that have recently uh, written on this subject. Jonathan Fisher QC, who's written uh, today. John Larkin, uh, former Attorney General for Northern Ireland. I think if he peruses uh, those opinions and those recent commentary, he may get the reassurance and the clarity he needs. Sir so John Redford. Uh, this Parliament is the main guarantor of our rights and liberties a parliament which created them in battles over many centuries for the benefit of us all. And wouldn't this great role be strengthened if our Supreme Court was indeed supreme and not answerable to foreign courts who did not understand the mood of the British people and what they expected of their legislators? Well, can I thank um, my right honourable friend? Uh, he's, uh, He's absolutely right, and I, I know when he gets a chance to peruse that those principles and that spirit that he'll find reflected in the Bill of Rights, and I look forward to uh, discussing these matters with him further. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Sec the Secretary of State has asserted that 70 per cent of successful human rights challenges are brought by foreign nationals who cite a right to family life <coughs> in the first instance when appealing deportation orders. Can you tell the House what's the source of that assertion? The consultation document gives you the precise, gives honourable members the precise source. It was published back in December. David Green. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I congratulate my uh, right honourable friend for resisting the siren voices in this House and outside, uh, telling him to withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights altogether? I think his decision to stay in it uh, is in the best traditions of pragmatic, sensible, one-nation conservatism. And can he also? Uh, confirm that the permission test he talked about to stop 
uh, frivolous uh, uses of human rights legislation uh, simply inserts into the British courts uh, a right that's already available to the Strasbourg Court under Article 35 of the Convention. Uh, my, my right honourable friend is right on all of those points. This is a principled and pragmatic reform. It <coughs> retains membership of the European Convention. I've heard various arguments against that, but when you look at what you would gain from leaving the ECHR because of the UN Convention Against Torture, which uh, uh, we are a state party to, and various other conventions, uh, it wouldn't solve all the problems. It's not the magic wand some people suggest uh, uh, it is, and I say that with great respect. Uh, what we've done is make sure that within the bounds of the Convention we can get the maximum leeway, the maximum margin of appreciation in the way the Right Honourable Member for Horton and Houghton suggested. On the, perm uh, the permissions test, it is, extraordinary, it is extraordinary that people have criticised doing something which the Strasbourg Court itself does. But I think making sure that whether they're trivial or frivolous claims, that we do have a filter early on to make sure that there is significant disadvantage. I think to many of our constituents that will just feel like old-fashioned common sense. Russell Roberts. The UK Government's scrapping of the Human Rights Act not only shows a callous disregard for the essential universality of human rights, but for devolution in Wales too. The Human Rights Act is woven directly into Wales' constitutional settlement. Changes to the Act will undermine our efforts to promote human rights and equality. Here, here. When, and when, not if, Wales refuses legislative consent to this erosion of human rights, Will he use legalistic bully boy tactics to trample on our democracy too? Here, here. I don't, I, no, of course not, Mr. Speaker. Um, <clears throat> can I just say, she talks about callous disregard. I think that, and certainly on this side, that we want to stand up for the victims of crime who don't understand why, based on the most elastic interpretations, foreign national offenders committed to some of the most abhorrent crimes cannot be deported. I think when it comes to parole, and I think of the victims that I've met recently, and I do not want to politicise them, but they expect us to stand up for them. When we're talking about protecting within our prisons, not just the prison regime, but also the public, about uh, serious ideologues spreading their poison or those convicted, convicted of terrorist offences, I think we should stand up for the public, not for the criminals. David Jones. Speaker, um, my right honourable friend made it absolutely clear in his statement uh, and uh, indeed has reiterated in his answers since that the government intends that the United Kingdom shall remain party to the European Convention on Human Rights. So it's hard to see the reason for the confusion on the part of the honourable lady opposite. Um, but does he uh, agree that judges of the United Kingdom Supreme Court are more than qualified to determine issues arising under that convention? and that the intervention of a supranational court is not always necessary or welcome. Yes. Well, the Honourable Gentleman, um, my, my, my Honourable Friend, is absolutely right. The irony, of course, when it comes to case law, there is nothing in the European Convention that requires the doctrine of precedent, which doesn't apply in the continental system, let alone in the Strasbourg Court, to somehow be uh, transported in relation to European case law to the UK. It is not required. Um, it, and, of course, when we have these debates, uh, and when we look at the text of this convention, I've been very clear. I'm very proud of the judiciary that we have in this country. As Lord Chancellor and as a member of this government, of course there'll be difficult decisions, and uh, from time to time, governments don't agree with them. But we have got a judiciary renowned the world over, and I think they should have the last word when it comes to interpreting the law of the land. And uh, it's extraordinary that the Labour Party, which is the one that changed the name of the Judicial Committee of the House of Lords to be the Supreme Court, would abrogate those rights and that authority. Yeah. So, Mr. Speaker, we know that the Supreme Court has reversed seven of its decisions in the last two years thanks to the bullying of the government. So, with the removal of some of the protection of, uh, will you look at the record? If we remove the protection of Strasbourg, don't we have a situation where things that are regarded as human rights abuse and illegal in Europe will become permissible in Britain? And if it's okay to have rights not applying in the UK, is it okay for other countries not to apply certain rights in Eastern Europe and Russia, in which case human rights become optional instead of universal and Winston Churchill would turn in his grave? Can I thank the Honourable Gentleman? I he betrays a fundamental lack of trust in the UK judiciary, which I don't share, but he's talked uh, about a lot of false premises, which a cursory reading of the Bill of Rights will, I'm sure, uh, clarify for him. Rob Butler. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. As a 
former journalist, I firmly believe that freedom of speech is an absolutely indispensable British value. So can my right honourable friend confirm to me and to this House that this essential right will be protected and safeguarded in what is a very welcome bill? Can I uh, thank my uh, honourable friend, who has ever uh, nails a very important part of why the Bill of Rights is a human rights enhancing uh, uh, innovation. And if he looks at uh, section 4, he will see that not only do we uh, prize free speech, but compared to human rights, we have reinforced uh, its role, uh, both in terms, for example, of journalistic sources and the protection of those. In relation to the, the clash or the balancing of rights between free speech and privacy, we do not want to see continental-style uh, privacy laws creeping through the back door. We've seen some evidence of that of late. We want to make sure that the tradition of openness, uh, transparency and accountability is preserved. And at various points, we're explicit in the Bill of Rights around this. Now, other countries may disagree. There is a pluralism around human rights, which uh, is often lost in the debate. But our tradition is to preserve the freedom of speech because it is a liberty that guards all the other freedoms we cherish. Uh, thank you. Uh, I do think the Justice Secretary has fully thought through the implications for mutual ex extradition arrangements across Europe, including those under the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. But with reference to the Good Friday Agreement, it is important to stress it ap applies to full effect of the Convention, not the Convention in name only. And does the Justice Secretary understand that, in particular, confidence around the new policing and criminal justice arrangements in Northern Ireland, including around legacy cases, are very heavily predicated upon that full adherence to the European Convention? He, he, the Honourable Gentleman raised an important point, and that is why I hope I can squarely give him the reassurance <coughs> not just that we remain in the State Party to the Convention, but that it is properly enshrined in the Bill of Rights. And, and that ought to answer all of the consequential questions that he is raising. Tom Hull. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, from what I can see, this is a very focused intervention, which might make it easier to kick out rapists and people who have broken the law, and also yeah, prevent yeah, yeah. people from arriving here illegally. The elephant in the room here is border control, something the people of this country have democratically voted for repeatedly, and something bitterly opposed by the opposition, whatever they say. Does the Lord Chancellor agree with me, though, that this is so important, because it will enable us to control our borders, deliver around the policy, but actually it should be ex expedited. I don't mind doing all-nighters. I don't mind staying up until two in the morning. And actually, I think most people in this country who want border control can see how this is a link to that, would want that. Thank the, uh, my honourable friend and share his restlessness to proceed with all due speed, because we've been talking about this for a long time. I wrote about it in a book in 2009. It was in our 2010 manifesto. But let me also just say, I think the consultation process is important. And, uh, Mr Speaker, we had a 12-week consultation on the consultation document, which included clauses. We are publishing it now, but there will be a space for further uh, scrutiny by Joint Committee of Human Rights, uh, the Justice Select Committee and others, including Lords com uh, Committees. Uh, and I do think it is important to garner cross-party support that we make sure that we have that scrutiny. It will make our reforms more robust when it enters into force. Deirdre. Uh, the Justice Secretary wrote recently, all UK citizens should be able to enjoy the same essential protections. So I return to my honourable friend's point. Will all the human rights he wishes to cover in his bill apply to all people in the UK or only UK citizens? And shouldn't human rights apply to everyone? Well, can I just give her one illustration? I think uh, we, we can't make um, uh, the, the international obligations not to make um, someone stateless. Um, and so I, I don't think that someone who is a UK citizen is in precisely the same legal position as a foreign national offender. But I think most people think we should have uh, 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 freedom under the rule of law, that we should be consistent applying the law, but also particularly the people who have been welcomed to this country should come here through lawful routes. People that commit serious crimes in this country should be removed. It's common sense, and I think the people of Scotland will, will, will not understand uh, how uh, honourable members here purporting to represent them would stand in the way of such a common sense measure. Richard Graham. Mr. Speaker, thank you. I'm reassured by the intentions behind this Bill of Rights by two things above all. Firstly, by the Justice Secretary's absolute commitment that we will remain party to the European Convention on Human Rights. And secondly, by what former Supreme Court Judge Lord Sumption wrote on the weekend, where he said that, quote, modifying the ECHR operation here need not mean abrogating human rights. We can have all or any of the rights in the Convention under ordinary domestic legislation. But would my right honourable friend help me understand why uh, he is proposing not 
to apply interim measures on courts in the UK and make them non-binding, because surely this would be a breach of international law, and wouldn't it be better instead to focus on winning an appeal against any interim measure which the government doesn't agree with? My honourable friend, he's always uh, sensible and judicious about this. In relation to interim orders, he will perhaps recall that Rule 39, which is the basis, is a rule of procedure of the Strasbourg Court. It's not part of the Convention, and the rules of procedure are only supposed to govern the internal workings uh, of the Strasbourg Court, not to apply. Uh, indeed, it's not just my view, it was the Strasbourg Court's view until 2005. I don't think it's right that you abrogate a power as a judicial institution, whether you're at home or abroad. That has to be given to you by the legislators or state parties or members of parliament here. And therefore, we're going to be clear about the impact on the UK courts and under UK law, and the Bill of Rights is right to squarely address that. It's a very good example of the creeping, shifting goalposts uh, contrary to any democratic oversight, and it's very important. And I just say finally on that point, it can't be right that the High Court, the Court of Appeal, uh, the Supreme Court, address this and say that in relation to uh, at least one case, and I, I want to be careful not to impinge on matters still subject to le legal proceedings, but as a matter of principle, that they look at these issues and see that there's no risk, no realistic risk, to those being removed, and then it is trumped by the, uh, the Strasbourg Court on what is a very vague basis. I don't think that's right as a matter of principle. If you can look this way now and again, it would be very, very helpful. It's hard to hear, if not. Martin Doherty Hughes. Two things don't surprise me today, Mr Speaker. The continuing utter disrespect to you as Chair of this House and the utter dearth of historical knowledge on the government front bench and also their backbenchers. Remind, there is no such thing as UK law. There's the law of England and Wales, the law of Northern Ireland and the law of Scotland. But on the point that the Secretary or the Deputy Prime Minister made, I wonder, in his next discussion with the Justice Minister of Ukraine, which is a signature to the Convention and a defender of the U Convention against the Russian Federation, which parts of the Convention does he think Ukraine should leave? Can I give him some reassurance? First of all, the Human Rights Act is a protected enactment, it's a precise example of UK wide application. I've met the Justice Minister of Ukraine, and I'll tell you what he said to me. He said thank you from the bottom of his heart for everything this country has done on sanctions, on support for the Ukrainian military, and also the role that we're playing alongside the Attorney General in supporting the ICC prosecution, supporting investigations on the ground in Ukraine to hold the commission of war crimes in Ukraine and those responsible to account. That's what the Justice Minister said to me. David Simmons. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. My constituent, Mr Lindop, who is trying to recover his kidnapped children from Poland. It will be one of many who are pleased to hear the government's continued determination to uphold these international standards. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, when I visited the European Court of Human Rights last week, I heard from the UK judge who was interviewed for his post by members of this House that the UK continues to have the lowest numbers of cases per capita referred to the court and also the lowest numbers of cases per capita that go against it of any country that is a member of the Convention. And this commitment to upholding the rule of law provides enormous moral authority for our international leadership role. So with that in mind, can I ask my right honourable friend, will he confirm once again on the record that with this new Bill of Rights, the UK will continue to uphold the highest possible standards of human rights and continue to be an example to other member states? Thank my honourable friend for the way he expressed and articulated his point. He's absolutely right. And so when people talk about the UK's record, of course, we've got one of the very highest levels of compliance with the ECHR compared to many of our European friends and partners. But of course, rarely but on occasion, there will be moments where there is mission creep and where we need to say, and prisoner voting was the example, where the goalpost shifted and we said that actually that was not something Parliament would accept. I was the Justice Minister in 2015 that went to the Committee of Ministers and said we uh, believe in staying in the European Convention but we feel this ruling is wrong on principle and we're not going to give prisoners the vote. We will maintain our high standards of compliance but also when it comes down to it the final word must stay with this House on critical issues of national importance. Jim Shannon. Thank you Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Secretary of State for his statement of the day. At present, Secretary of State, for many Christians, the UK courts have dealt more harshly with cases such as that of wearing a cross in work than the rulings of Strasbourg. Can the Secretary of State confirm that the right to 
um, to, to have religion and bel- and freedom to live and honor and uh, to live our belief in a, as much as it is not harmful to others will be protected in the Bill of Rights and our right to speak the name of Jesus and respectively preach the gospel will be upheld. Okay, can I thank uh, the honourable gentleman? He's right, I and mean, he sort of alludes to the, uh, the, the harm to others principle and the great John Stuart Mill tradition of liberty in this country. That's precisely what has infused the Bill of Rights. Um, and I think he will see uh, the principles that he's articulated reflected in the, the Bill of Rights, and, uh, and I look forward to continuing to discuss the detail with him over the weeks and months to follow. Jonathan Gullis. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I was one of those who shared the frustrations with my constituents in Stoke on Trent North, Kidscrove and Talk, when it came to seeing the Rwanda flight grounded and the deportation of foreign national offenders frustrated. Which is why I was one of those who openly said that we should withdraw from the European Convention of Human Rights. However, having engaged with my right honourable friend, and I'm very grateful for his time, I'm satisfied wholeheartedly that this Bill of Rights and reform into the interpretation of the European Convention on Human Rights with our UK Judicial Supreme Court is the appropriate way to go. And I'm happy to cede, therefore, that on this side of the argument I was wrong, something which I know doesn't also happen in this place very often. <laughs> so, can I get those reassurances from the dispatch box, from my right and my friend, for the people of Stoke on Trent North, Kidscrove and Talk, that this Bill of Rights will help the deportation of foreign national offenders and illegal economic migrants who come from safe mainland Europe? Madam Deputy Speaker, I think that was an almost unprecedented intervention, <laughs> but wholeheartedly welcome. Uh, uh, he fights very tenaciously, but he also engages us very forensically. I can give him the reassurances. I think the, the right thing to do is for, for us to discuss the Bill of Rights, the particular provisions, how they will apply, uh, but certainly in relation to Rule 39 and trim orders, uh, it is squarely addressed uh, in the Bill of Rights. Aaron Bell. Uh, We all support human rights, but my right hon. Friend will agree that human rights has been given a bad name in the past by cases brought by people, often offenders, who have shown absolutely no regard for the rights of others. Rights go along with responsibility, so could my right hon. Friend set out how the Bill of Rights will make sure the courts address responsibilities as well as rights? Can I thank uh, uh, my hon. Friend? Uh, One of the ways, I think, in which uh, they can do that is make sure, for example, when it comes to compensation, uh, that someone that has uh, uh, done harm or contributed to their own harm whilst claiming breaches of human rights, that's something that the, ju- the judges can take into account at the remedy stage. Of course, that's a, a, a principle uh, of law in this country already. Uh, we often say, uh, I remember studying uh, law as a, as a graduate and, uh, and the principle that those that come to equity must come with clean hands. Uh, it must be right, it must be consistent, it, I think for many people, just common sense, that we apply that principle in the context of human rights claims. Natalie Elf. Okay. Over 11,000 people have made that dangerous cross-channel journey this year alone, and it is undoubtedly the case that the European Court's decision, which led to the grounding of the Rwanda flight, has raised considerable concerns in my constituency of Dover and Deal, that it will simply encourage the people yep. traffickers. Yep people who have no respect for the rights of others, or in, including human life, or the laws of our land. Yeah. So can my right honourable friend expand on how this Bill of Rights will ensure that there's not such overreach by the European Court in the future? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. C- can I thank my honourable friend and just say, I think um, for many people, but I suspect particularly for her constituents, they will think that the, the real threat to human rights is allowing and not cracking down on this trade in human misery. Uh, she asked about how we will uh, reform the relationship with the Strasbourg Court. First of all, by freeing the UK courts uh, to diverge from the Strasbourg case law and being clear they don't need to take it into account. Uh, secondly, by making sure in the way I've already articulated that there's the equivalent of a democratic shield as we relied on in relation to prisoner voting, but reinforced and made clearer, uh, so that when it comes to the shifting goalposts, uh, whether they're uh, under judicial interpretation at home or abroad, Parliament has the last word. And secondly, in the relation to uh, the Rule 39 interim orders, and she'll find all of those expressly and explicitly addressed in the Bill of Rights. Yeah, Danny Kruger. Thank you very much. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, there's been much talk of, of Winston Churchill and the uh, authorship of the original convention by British Conservative judges. Uh, surely the fact is that the text of the original convention is absolutely fine. The problem is the application and the extension of the original meaning of the convention by Strasbourg judges over the decades since. So I very much welcome the commitment to raise the bar for Article 8 judgments. Uh, and I also welcome the 
commitment to, uh, to give judges the, UK judges the right to diverge from Strasbourg case law. My concern, however, is that some UK judges don't want to diverge from Strasbourg case law. In fact, they want to go further than Strasbourg in some cases. I think of Baroness Hale, of, uh, of blessed memory, uh, to members here. So can my right honourable friend assure me that we will genuinely be free of Strasbourg case law? Uh, and is it worth thinking about strengthening the uh, obligation on judges to disregard Strasbourg cases that don't apply in our context? Uh, can I thank you, uh, my honourable friend, and just say in relation to two things. One, <laughs> if you read section three of the Bill of Rights, I think he will find squarely and fully all his concerns addressed, but I urge him to have a look at it and come back to me. Um, and he makes another point, which I think is important, as if the European Convention was uh, the, 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 the exclusive authorship of Churchill or the United Kingdom. Um, and it is a remark, it's a, a sort of perverse um, uh, a reading of history, but also rather sort of neo-imperial one. And it is totally at odds with the way the European Convention was actually negotiated, which was a mixture of European countries, including the UK, and we were very centrally involved, but with other countries from a civil law background. And the European Convention, Convention reflects a mix of those traditions. Uh, as a result, it's unobjectionable, but when it comes to interpretation and application, I think uh, that's where the challenge has come. Uh, and so I think the points he made uh, are, are, are very valid. But this idea that it was a British creation is uh, almost neo-imperial myth-making. Jack Brereton. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. People in Stoke-on-Trent are sick and tired of human rights laws being abused by serious criminals yeah, and illegal yeah, migrants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So would my right honourable friend confirm to my constituents in Stoke-on-Trent South Sound that people. this Brit British Bill of Rights will restore the authority of this House and British courts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can give him precisely that assurance, give his constituents that reassurance. It is not anti-human rights. We're strengthening our tradition of freedom, including freedom of speech. Uh, it is pro-judges. We want our Supreme Court to have the last word on the law of the land when it's interpreted. And it is also pro-democracy. And that's the bit missing from the other side's critique. Because we believe that when the goalposts shift, it's elected members accountable to his, my and everyone's constituents that must have the last word on the law of the land. Yeah. Scott Benton. Deputy Speaker, the residents of Blackpool were absolutely furious at the European Court's move to block the first removal flight to Rwanda last week. They desperately want this policy to work and they will warmly welcome the measures outlined by the Deputy Prime Minister today. What assurances can he give them that these reforms will allow our relocations policy to be a success? Yeah. Can I say to my honourable friend, uh, there's no silver bullet in relation to that issue in small boats, um, and, uh, and even pulling out of the European Convention is not going to provide a silver bullet. While I can reassure him, and I'm happy to talk him through, that whether it relates to particularly deportation uh, of foreign national offenders, uh, but also, more generally, generally, when it comes to the public interest in removals, uh, respect and greater deference to primary legislation passed by this House, and in addition, the approach to Rule 39 in interim orders, we can give him and his constituents the assurances that he needs. Final question, James Taney. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I welcome this statement and say it is rather curious that my right honourable friend has been criticised for acting upon the democratic mandate given to him within our manifesto by millions of our fellow citizens. Millions of voters in this country voted in both the Brexit referendum and in the general election in 2019 for uh, control of our borders and to prevent illegal immigration. It is the job of courts to interpret the will of Parliament, not to invent law themselves. And therefore, the policy that he's putting in place, the Bill of Rights, not only protects the fundamental rights that we all enjoy, but gives the, vo the democratic voice of the British people a role in the decision-making process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's absolutely right. And in a democracy, you command, uh, you, you rule, you govern by consent. Yeah. And we're at risk of losing public confidence in uh, our immigration controls if we can't take the measures, the common sense measures they expect. And we're also at risk of losing public confidence in human rights if we don't restore a healthy dose of common sense. 